Hey friends, it's been a while. It's good to see you. I, um, I often will come, you know, early and I'll find a parking lot and just kind of, you know, sit and read or think about what I'm going to do. And so today, I, I was just over here at the mortuary parking lot and I was facing, you know, there's that, where the auto parts and Starbucks and all that is, there's that little alley, so I was facing that. And there was this young man, uh, 20, I'm, I'm quite certain, and I, 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 you get the impression that he probably was um, living outdoors, you know, he wasn't, he didn't have a house, and, um, and he, was, he was bright in that he had found uh, an outlet and he plugged in his phone, he was charging it. Anyhow, so as I'm, you know, looking and reading and playing with my phone a little bit, he, um, he kept looking at me, like, I mean, right at me. And, you know, sometimes where you get that weird vibe, you know, something a little weird here. And so I kept looking at him. And I think he was going, I'm getting a little weird vibe here. <laughs> that guy keeps looking at me. So anyhow, he got up, and this is a true story, and so he walks towards me. He starts walking towards me, and like with intention, you know, and so now he's got my attention. And so he, I mean, he looks right at me, and then he, he turns about 20 yards from me, and he keeps looking over his shoulder at me. I mean, pretty much like this the whole time. Um, and, and he does, he makes this big loop doing that the entire time. He goes back to his backpack, picks it up, begins to walk away the whole time still looking at me, and then, moments before he's out of my sight, he reaches back and he flips me the bird. <laughs> if those of you are watching, I don't know, maybe you're not in our country. That's not an invitation, and it doesn't mean I'm number one. Um, <laughs> I was thinking, I wonder if church is kind of like that. That's what I feel like as a preacher. You're watching me, I'm watching you. You're a little suspicious. And then I have this deep-seated belief that when you're going home, you're kind of flipping me the bird, you know. That this, I got up early for this. I, I fit that story in because I just love that story, and it was true. Anyhow, I, um, I, I, I know that our conversations have been about community, and it's, I'm not very good at titles. I like writing sermons. I like speaking but I'm, I, I'm, I'm just terrible at making titles. So t today, I, I just, I call this Family Foundations. I would have preferred to have called it why we should consider all getting drunk. And I'll tell you why. As some of you know a little bit of my story, this September, I will have gone 12 years without a drink. I'll have been sober during these 12 years. And part of that sobriety process for me was early on being invested into a community of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, I want you to know that this morning as I lay out the culture and some of the values, and I'm not preaching the gospel of Alcoholics Anonymous. Hang with me, I'll... I'll hopefully make a good transition. You're familiar with what's called the 12 steps. And in the 12 steps, there is this, uh, there's a process by which um, many, many people have found sobriety. I, I just want to read the first three for you. It is, it is the foundation of all that happens at a a fellowship of Alcoholics, Alcoholics Anonymous. And then I'll reread them with some slight changes to help us be part of this community. Step one, we admitted that we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives had become unmanageable. Step two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And step three, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. 
Not everyone here is an alcoholic. But everyone here is a broken and addicted person. So perhaps for us, this little revision would be helpful. We admitted that we were powerless. That we could not self-improve our lives. That we could not piece together our brokenness. That no matter how hard we've tried, those things which plague us, those habits which we continue in, those impulses which we give into. We are powerless. And we cannot manage our own lives. We came to believe that a, that a power, that a God greater than us could restore us to life. And we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to Jesus. That's how we have understood God. You see, you can have a, a meeting or a prayer meeting, a fellowship, a, you could do service projects. You could gather at 10 in the morning and, and you could have music and Bible reading and sermons. But you won't have community. You won't have community if these principles, these values are not a part of why we've come together. If we collectively can't admit that we're powerless. If collectively we can't believe that there is a person who loves us is greater than us, who can do what we could never do, and if collectively our conversation, our passion is not about the one who could rescue us, who could restore us, then I would say I don't know that we have church. Now, I, I do want to say, I've, over in these many years, I have come to love every expression of church. I love church. I love huge church. I love little church. I love liturgical church. I love backward church. I, 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 I I love church. That's not what I'm talking about. But I want to share with you why I believe this culture that I experienced in Alcoholics Anonymous is perhaps the culture that we are looking for and the culture that we want if, in fact, we really do want this thing that we call community. In the AA culture, You cannot recover in isolation. You, maybe that's too strong a word, you can't, but I, I think in, in every AA fellowship, they would say to you, wanting those of you who are wanting to be sober, that it is very rare and very unlikely that you will alone find the sobriety that you long for. Why does the church make such a big deal about us being together? It's because alone, you're not going to experience the sobriety, the freedom that you want. It is our stories collected that give us the, the hope we long for. 
In Alcoholics Anonymous, perhaps you're familiar with the, the big book. You see, in AA, we are guided by a big book. I bet you can make a little shift to the church here, couldn't you? We, as the gathered community, we are guided by a big book. Did you know that without the Bible, without the Scriptures, we would know nothing, almost nothing, about Jesus who walked the earth? Very little historical reference to him. There are no quotes accurately given to him outside of the Scriptures. That without our book, we wouldn't know him. Can you imagine if 2,000 years later, and we did not have this book to guide us, and we tried to get together to talk about him, what would we do? And what would it look like? You see, it's no wonder that he is called the Word. The Bible brilliantly is written with the understanding that we learn best through stories and word pictures. And I'll bet you've noticed the stories in our word that describe our community. We are a a nation, we are a people, we are a body comprised of many parts. We're a wedding, we're a wedding party, we are a family, and all these share one characteristic. You can't do any of those alone. And you can't do any of those without this book. We don't worship a book. We worship the one who's being, whose story is being told by this book. Now, you probably know that the word Bible is not some holy, sacred word. The word Bible is simply uh, like library or collection. And so we have this collection of 66 stories written over thousands of years by many different authors from all kinds of different places, rich and poor, smart and not so smart all telling this story to help us understand this story that we are powerless we are powerless we cannot rescue ourselves there has been in this what in my observation in these last several years, even from people who are maybe part of this community, this fellowship of church slash AA, who have become extremely critical of this book. In fact, they, they have wanted to simply make the book about primarily three autobiographies, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And that's what we call the, the three of the four Gospels. Now, I, I know that Jesus is the pinnacle of the story. I know that he is, is what the story is about, but I don't think we know the Jesus of Matthew, Mark, and Luke without the rest of those 63 books. As an example, go home today, Take your favorite novel. Randomly, just rip out four chapters and read the novel. My hunch is it'll make no sense. You won't be able to understand the conclusion if you don't know the whole story. I know that the Bible can be hard. I know that there's parts where you can't understand how does this relate Just hang on. 
My experience with people who have read the big book but find it to be not very helpful, haven't given it enough time. Maybe instead of ripping that chapter out of the library, you leave it in. Maybe you ask your friends. Or maybe you admit that while you don't understand, you're willing, you're willing to continue to want to understand. In AA, there is a burning desire to bring this message to others. One of the later steps is that that's what we do. We we go find that person who needs and wants to be rescued. There is, in every meeting I've ever been to, there is no culture of judgment for those who are not there. There is no conversation about how dumb or silly or whatever you might want to call those people who have not yet found sobriety. There's no condemnation because all of them know that at some point they were not in that chair. And they know that a person ridiculed them and mocking them, condescending to them, would never have been helpful to help them get into that chair. There isn't a talk of being better, different. Here's what their evangelism, and they use that word shows up in the in the big book. They simply share their experience, their strength, and their hope. But they do that intentionally. They share their experience, their strength, and their hope. I understand that this word evangelism can create a stomachache for a lot of us. Like it just, it just, it makes my skin crawl because I think of this evangelism which I was taught, which was not a humble experience of gratitude for my own experience strength and hope, but was simply a way to express that I was better than. And perhaps you've experienced the evangelism which is rooted in arguing or or being smarter than, not very appealing. I've never had someone who was offended when they wanted to be in conversation, who was ever offended or put off when I've shared my own experience, strength, and hope. I know that there uh, might be those of you who might say that your experience seems not that special. You don't have this unbelievable story of having been, you know, in the gutter drunk, as our analogy might go, and then finding sobriety. But oh, your experience of maybe you were rescued as a child. Within our community, that's so helpful. It's so helpful to know that we've all had a different way of being rescued. I say that because I believe this idea of evangelism has become based on some of our experiences or for whatever reason, it has been lost in some way. I have been in, 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 in different kinds of churches for a long time. And there, there, there was a culture that was developing, and I recognized it because this is not hyperbole, but for, I would say, almost 10 years, with, and this is crazy, without exception, 100% of the time, when the conversation would would somehow come up, and I would mention that, that Jesus wanting 
all to know about his, his rescue for them, that they don't have to live powerless and hopeless. That Jesus said, I want you to go into all the world and I want you to tell people about your experience and your strength and your hope. I want you to evangelize. A hundred percent of the time I heard this. You probably know the end of this quote. Preach the gospel at all times. And when necessary, use words. I certainly am sympathetic to the spirit of that. In other words, that I can't just have words with no life. But in my whole life, I've never had somebody, as I was walking through the grocery store, come to me and say, oh, man, I've never seen somebody grocery shop with that kind of joy. You see, I've never, I've never had the sense that it was the responsibility of the person who has never known or experienced that they could live. That's happened as somebody told them about that. Whether it was through a book or a person or a video or every person almost to to a one who has come to know this Jesus who rescued us is because somebody told them that story. The reason there is a fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous is to simply continue to remind ourselves that we have a story to tell. And because of our gratitude, we're happy to tell that story. That's my introduction. So the introduction's over, and you may be timing that. Introductions are typically a third of a message, so I'll let you do the math. But the sermon is much smaller. For our purpose today, I wanted to share with you one verse that I believe will illuminate and become a foundation and a culture for the community I'm talking about. I recognize that this verse has often been, I think, perhaps misused. I think often misunderstood. But it's one that's very familiar. It's found in Romans, in chapter 8, 28. All things work together for good for those who love God and are called to his purpose. My version may be different than what's on the screen, I I have made a, a, a slight edit. But you get the idea. All things work together for good for those who love God and are called to his purpose. Now, why is it that this verse I find to be the, the, the catalyst and the, and the grease or what, the secret sauce to community? Well, it's, it's this. One, the misunderstanding has been that we primarily read the Bible alone. So therefore, the Bible must speak to me primarily or exclusively as an individual. And so we read it this way, all things work together for me. The Bible was very often, more often than with the exception, written to people who did not read or did not have access. And the Bible was primarily almost always written And read and experienced how? Not alone in your devotion 
which is marvelous. But as a group, as a small group, who when they heard the words didn't think of me, but they thought of us. Here's how that verse works for us. All things work together for good for us, collectively, who have had the experience of loving God and being part of his purpose. The reason I say that is, it is not necessary to say to the person who has just experienced tragedy and horror, loss, it's not necessary in that moment to tell them that one day you're gonna be happy about this. One day this will all make sense to you. One day you'll see how this all works. But here's what I know. That every story shared in community becomes sacred. Every honest and true story shared and experienced in community is holy and will shape that community. It doesn't mean that they become happier. It means that they become connected. I've done some funerals. I did one for one of my son's best friends whose cousin suicided, died by suicide. One of the most horrible experiences for a family. He was also a gang member. How can, how can the horror of what that family has experienced ever be used for good? At the end of my, my time, which was small, in which I shared, hopefully, my experience and strength and hope, Oh, I hope I said it without condemnation or judgment, but humbly because I'm no different. His gang members were all wearing his colors, the colors of their gang. And they each came and, and left mementos at that altar. A 40, a fifth, Some marijuana, some instruments of violence. And that experience for one or two of those gang members illuminated to them where their life was going to go. Did that take all the pain from the family that experienced that horror? No, not in that moment. But knowing that God had made good in those couple of young people's lives was helpful. This is as part of the secret sauce of community that this uh, hard to understand, but it is a big part of our story. It goes like this. You see, without having experienced being drunk, I would have never known the joy of being sober. The scriptures say it like this. Without sin... Without a, 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 a confession, an understanding, a submission to this idea that I've sinned, I'll never know what grace is. I'll never know what it's like to have my story which drives me into the dark shadow of shame. I'll never know what it's like when the light is illuminated on that. When grace invades that, 
This idea that there is now no judgment for those in Christ. And all things work together for good. Even my alcoholism? Oh, yeah. You see, if I hadn't had whatever moment of clarity and absolute desperation, I wouldn't have become sober. If I hadn't been rescued, I wouldn't have gotten sober. Why? If I hadn't gotten sober, I would have lost my family and my marriage. No doubt. It wasn't because I quit drinking. It was because I, for the first time, knew what grace was. Now, I, I believe that the grace is the most terrifying word in the Bible, I think. It terrifies us to, to think that there is nothing I can do. That, that the God who will work all things together doesn't want my help with that. <laughs> doesn't need me to do that, that. That he can hear my whole story. And absolutely with no hesitation love me. Grace is so terrifying that often we have a couple of responses to it. One is we will create rules around it because we can't let it just be out there. Well, we've got to create some rules on how you can have that. You, 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 you have to attend something or you, you, you have to make a promise that you're going to be better. Or you, you, you've whatever the rules might be. And the other is that I will take advantage of it. It's funny, the Bible even talks about that. It, it says where there's sin, there is always just a tad more grace. You can never out-sin grace. Here's the weird thing, more sin, more grace. And, and then later on, he, it says, well, now, if you think that you want to take advantage of that, that's silly. That's like saying, you know, the more drunk I got, mm, the better it was. Why would you want to go back to that? I, I, I know I've used this word sin, and I haven't really defined it. I, I just simply think sin is when I believe I can be God. Sin is simply when I make a decision that I believe is going to make my life better regardless of what I think God would want me to do. It's like God and I have a little conversation. God says, Carl, I really think you should do this. And I say, well, I don't understand that. doesn't make sense. I'm going to do this. That's what sin is. And grace floods that. God is not offended, but he's moved. All right, let me share one story. I've shared it, I guess, if maybe, I don't know, with you guys. I suppose I probably have. It is my favorite story of rescue. It's the one that's helped me the most. And it was my own experience. When my kids were little, we, um, as a family, we did a lot of skiing. And um, we would always go to the same place because my wife's family had a little condo there. It was, it's in South... Um, southwest Colorado, it, it's outside of Durango. It's called Purgatory. I don't know if you're a skier or familiar with it, but it's a marvelous ski area. And so for all of our Christmases and vacations, that's typically where we would go. And so my kids began skiing pretty young, pretty early. And, and so I, I really just wanted them to, you know, be safe. So I had these two rules. I said, I don't want you to ski near anyone else. I don't want you to run into somebody. If you want to die, do it alone. And don't ski near the edges. The edge is where all the bad stuff happens. There's trees, there's cliffs. Those are the only two rules. Don't run into people. Don't, don't get near the edges. So, if you've been a skier, you'll know this. If not, a lot of times, skis areas usually have more than one mountain, and to get from one area to the other, from one lift to the other, you have to take, they call them catwalks. 
And they're just narrow trails. They're not really fun for skiing, but they get you over to another place where you do want to ski. We were on a very long one of these. I always skied last. You know, I would let the family go first. You know, that way, you know, if they had some collapse, I could at least, you know, go pick up all the body parts. So I, on this long slope, I remember it very clearly. Just, I, I, I was on a hill, and I could see pretty far below where you would come out. I, was, I couldn't see this middle part because there was a, it was downward, but I saw as they came out, and I could see folks sort of gliding in to the chairlift, the next chairlift, you follow? And so I saw down there, I saw my wife. She, she would ski first, I would ski last, kids in the middle. So she, she scooted out and glid, you know, slided into the, into the lift, and, and then I saw my little Carla, I recognized her little pink outfit, and, and there she is, and then I, I'm anticipating my son, Brandon who is now six years old. I don't see him. No Brandon. I wait. Maybe he stopped. I wait and I wait. When you're on a, a catwalk, often there's people, you know, just coming by you, and you hear that shoo, shoo. So I move over to the edge, and I'm trying to listen. I'm trying to watch. I begin to become afraid. And I... I think I hear something. I think I hear something, but I'm not sure. But I can't tell if that the, just the wind or the skis. And finally, I hear this dad, the scream, like a blood curling scream. And it's up above me. I'd skied past him, so I take off my skis and I run up. And my son, my son, is over the edge of the cliff. And it is pretty steep, and he has fallen backwards first into a V, into deep, deep snow. So there are skis and a face. And he's screaming, like, you've seen somebody who is terrified. He is terrified. And so I stand at the edge of that cliff, and I say to him, remember rule number two? Oh, what a great parenting opportunity, right? I can reinforce all the natural consequences of his misbehavior. That's not what I do. There is no thought. There is no thinking about it. I jump. I just jump. And of course I grab him. I don't know if you've ever rescued like an animal and they just start to claw you. <laughs> That's Brandon climbing up on me. He'd been crying, hysterical. Take his skis off and I toss him up and then we crawl back up. So God stands at the edge of heaven, right? And he looks down at us and he says, hey! Remember those 10 things I mentioned? The story of the scripture is that all things work together for good. Even when I fly off the edge. Because God in his without thinking compassion, the Bible says he leaps from heaven to rescue us. Community is the collective experience of being rescued. Hey, let's pray together. Lord, we long for you to Remind us, uh, to empower us, uh, to give us courage. Your, your grace, it scares me. I'm so afraid. I'm so afraid to tell about some of the decisions I've made. 
Sometimes I'm so scared to say out loud some of the things that have been done to me. Father, I pray for my friends here. I know deep in there, I know they long for this thing you call community. I know that. And I pray that they would know and always be reminded that you rescued them. You did not lecture them. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, um, as we move to the table, I was thinking about this word vulnerability, and I was thinking about how often vulnerability is kind of misunderstood in our culture. Like, I think a lot of times when we, when we think about vulnerability, we think about telling people our deepest, darkest secrets. Um, and that's really scary. <laughs> but, but I think vulnerability, it means being open, right? It means being defenseless. It means being powerless. And, and so as we, as we partake of the table today, we, we think, we think about this word powerless. Because when we come to the table, we are powerless. What we're doing at the table is we're receiving. We're not taking. We're not earning this somehow. We're not trading or buying this. It's not a transaction. But we're simply receiving the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. And, and this act of power, powerlessness is, is really the truest act of vulnerability. Because on the night that our Lord was betrayed, he was with his disciples in the upper room and he did what he always did. He, he blessed it and he broke the bread. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Open for you. Right? This true act of powerlessness and vulnerability. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out. And every time you partake of this bread and drink of this cup, you do so, proclaiming my death. And ultimately, we know his resurrection. And so, as we come to the table together, it's this collective experience of being rescued. The truest act of community, really, in worship, is to come and receive and to know that you need rescued. Just as um, they say in the 12 steps, you know, we, we admit that we are powerless. But in the same way as you receive of this powerless, broken, vulnerable body of Christ, <laughs> as you receive it, as you take it, as you ingest it. You receive a power that is actually life-giving. And this power actually enables you to go out into the world and to share about this, to talk about it, to show people. And so, as we come to the table together this morning, we come as one. We come as one body, broken, vulnerable and powerless. Just receive and admit you are powerless. Let's come to the table this morning. I didn't know that the cups were wine. I'm usually really careful about those things, but I don't know why I wasn't thinking today. can't tell you how good that tastes. You, you know how you're, you just remember how warm you could feel. It scares me. Uh, 
I, I mean, I don't know what all that means, but I know that for my benediction today, I, 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 I just thought this, this tiny little verse, that with God all things are possible. Even to live without a drink, remembering how much I want to drink. Help us today. I'm so powerless. <laughs>